Take your Bible this morning, if you would, for our scripture reading. Psalm 34, please, the 34th Psalm. Psalm 34, please. We're going to read verses 18 through 22. Verses 18 through 22. Read them responsibly. We begin together on verse 18, then I'll read 19 together on 20, and alternating till we end together on verse 22 of Psalm 34. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse number 18. Ready? The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this morning. And I pray, God, I, I just want to thank you already for the wonderful music today. Sure has been good to be in church this morning. Uh, Lord, thank you for the choir number. Thank you for the offertory. Thank you for the special blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Thank you for the good singing by the congregation this morning. Uh, it's just been a good day already in the house of the Lord. I pray you'll bless the special as it's sung before the message, and you'll help us and speak to our hearts through your word today. It's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. My father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands. Of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold, his coffers are full. He has riches untold. My father's own son, the savior of men, once wandered on earth as the poorest of men. But now he is reigning forever on high, and he will give me a home in his heaven by and by. I once was an outcast, a stranger on earth, a sinner by choice and an alien by birth. But I've been adopted, my name's written down, an heir to a mansion, a robe and a crown, a tent or a cottage. Why should I care? They're building a castle for me. Over there, though exiled from home, yet still I may sing all glory to God. I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King, with Jesus my Savior. I'm a child of the King. Oh, that's good. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be called children of the King. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for sending your Son to die for us. And, Lord, I pray you'll help me this morning as I bring the message. And, uh, Lord, I want to help the folks that are here this morning as you lay this message on my heart for today. Lord, I have no way of knowing who will be in attendance, uh, who will be present. 
But Lord, you knew exactly who would be here. You know exactly who needs the message today. And so I pray you would use it to, to help every one of us. And Lord, help particularly those who have a broken heart that are here this morning. And I'll thank you for what you'll do. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Commit. Wherever this was in Sunday school, it's not there now. So try to do whatever you did then. Do it again, all right? And uh, that'll, that'll help us. It doesn't seem quite as loud as it was, so is it? No, because I'm not hearing it either. So <clears throat> give it a little more if you can. That'll be great, all right? Um, behind every face, there's a broken heart. Behind every smile, there's a reason to cry. Everybody here, possibly in the last year, certainly in the last five years, has experienced some sort of suffering or emotionally, physically, or spiritually. Your heart could still be broken over the death of a loved one. You're, maybe you've lost a job. Maybe some personal failure in your own life that has broken your heart or the life of a loved one. Maybe a long-term illness or a child with a long-term illness or maybe a child that has gone rebellious and maybe left home or just not living like they should. And when things like that happen to us, it, it feels like our heart has been ripped in half. Broken hearted. How do you continue? How do, you, how do you keep going when it feels like there's a knife stuck into you? Arthur Barbara Johnson's son was serving with the Maroon, Marines in Vietnam when he was killed. Five years later, another son was hit and killed by a drunk driver. Two years later, after his graduation, her son, her third son, told her that he was homosexual. We graduated college where he had just been voted the most outstanding student in the school. Grief compounded on grief, and she writes, The knife in my heart was so sharp I thought I would die. She wrote, I think I'm having a heart attack. I don't know what you call it, but I think I'm dying. I can't breathe. I'm choking. It feels like I've got a rug in my throat. She would write, All the promises of God are there, and they're real, and they're true. But right now, I'm bleeding, and I'm hurting. And I have to hang on to those promises, even if they don't seem to work for me at the moment. You know, <clears throat> anybody who you hear that has a great, seemingly a great ministry now, or great compassion now, has gone through heartache at some time in their life. I, I, uh, how many of you ever hear David Jeremiah on the radio or the television? Many, almost everybody here. And uh, I, I read out David Jeremiah when his daughter was 16 in the Christian school, got arrested for cocaine. Most people don't know that he went through that. Boy, that'll stick a knife in your heart. You're the pastor's daughter. You see? She's recovered, and she's doing very well today, and everything is great. But you understand? Everybody goes through times when they're brokenhearted. I believe everybody in this room at some point has had some kind of a broken heart. The Bible, the Bible cites many cases. The great thing about the Bible is it doesn't sugarcoat things. You, 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 you see the, uh, it, it reminds me of the, the, the person who was doing a portrait of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, they, he sat for the portrait, and, uh, and he wanted Abraham Lincoln to look at it, and they looked at it, but they did not, he had a wart, you know, and, uh, and, and a wart on his nose, and, and the, the portrait, the one who was doing the, what do they call someone who does a portrait? Artist, I guess, left it off. And, and Lincoln didn't like it. He said, no, 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 he says, that's not what I want. He says, I want you to paint me wart and all. And when the Bible is, records these men of the Bible, you know what? It gives us the warts and all. It gives us not just the highlights, it gives us the lowlights too. And, and we know that David was a man after God's own heart, but David had some heartbreak in his life too. 
some of his own behavior, some where his own son rebelled against him and went away from him, and he had great grief over that and great heartache. Job, Job had great affliction and great heartache that God brought into his life and allowed into his life. Moses killed a man and lived with that all of his life. Peter denied that he knew Jesus, cursed and swore and denied that he knew him. John Mark turned back on the missionary journey. Paul had criticism and attacks on him, and, and all of them went through heartache. I'm, 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 I know that I'm looking at people this morning that have been through heartache, or you're in the middle of it now. It may be divorce. It may be financially bad choices. It may have been financially bankrupt. It might have been that dad or mom has left home. It might be the loss of a loved one. It might be the doctor said cancer. But all of it brought a broken heart. I want you to look at Psalm 34 again with me if your Bible's still open there. And notice what the Bible says in Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. And save us such that be of a contrite spirit. If you're here today and you say, yeah, these, some of these things have happened and I may not have listed exactly what it is that caused your heart to break, but you're here this morning and say, yeah, I've got a broken heart. I've got good news for you. The Lord is nigh to you that are of a broken heart. Look at Isaiah 61 with me, will you please? In fact, if you get Isaiah 61, uh, pick up Luke chapter 4 also, okay? Put a finger in Isaiah 61. We're going to read that first. And then we'll flip over to Luke chapter 4. And we'll read that next. Okay. Uh, Isaiah 61 and Luke chapter 4. Isaiah 61. And look with me at verse number 1. Will you? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now remember that passage right there and look at Luke chapter 4. In Luke 4, Jesus, verse number 16, He came to Nazareth where He had been brought up, and as His custom was, He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto Him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when He had opened the book, He found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to, what church? Heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down, and, all the, eye, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Did you notice that the ministry of Jesus Christ was to bind up the brokenhearted? He quoted the verse and read the verse from Isaiah. He didn't, he, he, he didn't say he'll keep us from being brokenhearted. He said he'll bind up or bandage up the broken hearts. And he will help us. David was brokenhearted. Nehemiah was brokenhearted. Isaac was brokenhearted. Jacob was brokenhearted. Job was brokenhearted. Jeremiah was brokenhearted. Peter was brokenhearted. Paul was brokenhearted. The disciples of Christ were brokenhearted. And listen, you or someone you know will be brokenhearted. You will not get through life without one. It will come to everybody. And some are right there this morning. Now, God is the only one who's going to heal a broken heart. He's the only one who can do that. He has the ability to do that. God sees our heart. God knows our heart. God can heal our heart. But what can you and I do to help somebody who's broken hearted? Okay? We're, if, if Christ 
was ministering to the brokenhearted, how can you and I minister to people that are brokenhearted? How many of you, how many of you know somebody right now, you, somebody comes to your mind when I say someone that's brokenhearted right now? Anybody? You know somebody like that? Look at that. I think everybody can put their hand up. And it may be, you may be raising your hand for yourself. I don't know. But certainly if it's not you, it's somebody you know. Well, how can we help them? All right, let me give you some very practical things this morning on how to help the brokenhearted. Number one is this, be the same. You be the same. Be the same towards the brokenhearted one as you always have been. Peter, after he denied the Lord, do you remember what the Bible says? What did Peter do after he denied the Lord and the cop crew? Peter went out and did what? He wept bitterly broken hearted over what he'd done uh, very very upset over what he had just done in denying the Lord Jesus now the great thing about it is Jesus remained the same we'll let them go here Jesus remained the same towards Peter Jesus never treated him any differently Jesus treated him just like all the rest of the disciples. In fact, you remember when the angel uh, announced to the uh, women at the tomb uh, that Jesus was risen from the dead? They said, now you go back, Mark 16, you go back and tell the disciples and Peter that he's risen from the dead. And I, and I, I got to believe at that point, Peter, because of his brokenheartedness, really didn't feel like he was any longer a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I think if he had just said, go tell his disciples, Peter would have thought, well, that doesn't include me. But when he said specifically, make sure you tell the disciples and Peter, I wonder if Peter said, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, ladies. Are you sure he said my name? Are you sure he said Peter? And they said, absolutely, he said Peter. And I think that was a message from the Lord to say, Peter, I'm still the same. Peter, I know you're brokenhearted. And you know what's amazing? Jesus never mentions it to Peter at all. You go to John 21 when, when they're fishing. In fact, look there with me, will you? Go to John chapter 21. This is a great, great passage. You know, they, Peter's going fishing. He takes other guys with him. And, and, and we'll say more about that in just a little bit. And, and they don't catch anything, and Jesus stands on the shore and tells them that uh, you haven't caught anything and cast your net on the other side of the ship. And they did, and they couldn't draw, draw the net in. So many fish were in it. And, of course, John realizes that it's Jesus, and Peter jumps in the sea, and they come to the shore. And as soon as they were come to land, verse 9, uh, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon. And Jesus saying to them, Bring in the fish which ye have caught. And, of course, they bring the fish in. Jesus says in verse 12, come and dine. Nobody had asked, who, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. And then Jesus, uh, the third time, verse 14, that he showed himself to his disciples. So when they had dined, verse 15, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he said to him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. And then, you know, he said it the second time, and he said it the third time. But what didn't he say? What were you doing, Peter? Why were you out there warming your hands at the fire with all the enemies? Why, what, what, what were you doing hanging around that crowd? He never, never brought up the denial one time. He didn't mention it. Never said anything about it. And I think, I think partly is this. When you, every time, if, if you've ever experienced something like Peter, oh, maybe not have denied the Lord, but maybe done something that you wish you never would have done, when, when it's talked about and somebody brings it up to you, it's just like opening the wound up again. It's just like picking that scab. You ever have something start to heal, a, a, a wound to heal, and then you start to pick at it or you hit it against something and it pulls some of that scab off, and what's it do? It starts to bleed all over again, doesn't it? Jesus never did that. Just be the same to that person who's heartbroken. Uh, the, the prodigal son returned home. What did the dad do? He welcomed him. He never said, well, what'd you blow the money on? Huh? What have you been doing? 
He didn't say anything. He just welcomed him home and, and put the robe on him, on him and the ring on his finger and, and never spoke of his sin of leaving home and wasting his inheritance. And by the way, the son knew he could come home because he knew dad would be there. He knew everything would still be going on like it always was. See, be the same. Be the same toward them. Don't act differently toward them. Number two, number two, don't analyze them. Job's friends made this mistake. They came and, and when they heard of Job's troubles and, and all that happened to Job, they came and the Bible says they sat down for seven days and didn't say anything. Okay? So, and by the way, that was pretty good, but I think the problem was they were analyzing everything. They were trying to think about it. And, and then they broke the silence by telling Job what was going on, what, what kind of mistakes he made, that he's a sinner, that, that Job, you're not as spiritual as you think you are. And, and they had it all figured out. In other words, they were trying to tell Job, I know why you're going through what you're going through. And by the way, let me ask you a question. Were any of them right? No. So don't be so absolutely sure when you look at someone who's broken hearted or going through a hard time and you think, well, I know why they're going through that. You may be as far off as left field from right field. They were. Can I, can I tell you something? You and I have no idea why God does what he does. God, His ways are so far above our ways and His thoughts so far above our thoughts. We, we think we figure what out what God's doing and I wonder sometimes why, why the Bible says God, God kind of sits in the heavens and laughs. And He laughs at us thinking we have it all figured out. I don't know why God does what He does. I can't tell you why God put Job through what He put him through. I don't know that. And I don't know why God puts you through what you go through. I don't understand that. Don't, don't begin to, to figure that. But our job when you're helping someone who's broken hearted is not to figure out why. It's not your job to fix it. Okay? We're, we're not going to analyze it and try to figure it out. I don't know why. I don't know why people get cancer. We were, I'd only pastored four years. I wasn't even 30 years old. And I'd do a funeral service for a 32-year-old mother that left behind two children under six years of age. I don't know why. I don't know why that would happen. I can't explain that. But I, I can't explain why children go astray, why, why you can have four children in a family and three of them turn out and live for God and one doesn't. They all heard the same thing. They all sat in the same preaching. They all were taught the same at home, all loved the same. I can't explain that. I can't explain why loved ones die or accidents or tragedies. I don't understand why, why the, the missionary we support down in Haiti in Dominican Republic, Brother Johnston, and in a car wreck, and the, uh, they get rear-ended by a truck and pushed in their lane and flipped into a ditch, and the car lands basically on top of him, and he's dead. And his wife is unhurt in the crash. I can't explain that. I don't explain why God can uh, uh, bring Brother Steve Currington back and uh, get him right with God and, and then give him all the, the, the curriculum for the RU program and the, the, the books that he wrote and the, the, the helpful things he had and then in 2010 give him a massive heart attack and take him to heaven. Doesn't make sense to me. But God, God can do whatever God wants to do. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So don't analyze why it's, what's happening. What's, well, what am I supposed to do, Pastor? You're supposed to love them, be kind to them, be considerate of them. That's all. You don't have to figure it out. Okay? So we don't analyze them. We're the same. We don't analyze them. Number three, don't tell them negative things. When you're broken hearted, you don't need to hear negative things. Don't, don't say, hey, I want you to know I'm for you no matter how bad it gets. Oh, thanks a lot. Or I love you even though nobody else does. Thanks a lot. 
Did you know? Did you know if you're something bad, you don't have to repeat it? Do you understand that? Bad truth doesn't have to be repeated. Sometimes somebody says something bad, and they say, yeah, but it's the truth. Well, just because it's bad truth doesn't mean you have to tell it to everybody else. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. It didn't say, don't let much, or just let a little bit. No, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That word corrupt is to change from a sound to a putrid state. It means something that, that uh, things were good until you put your comment in and then things turned bad real quick. You ever been in those situations? You can be in a conversation with, with people or maybe with several people or maybe just with another person and boy, something comes out and it just deadens everything right there because it was corrupt communication and it made the conversation stinky real quick. Okay? Be positive. Stay, stay on things that are good to the use of edifying. Edifying means what? Build up. We talked in Sunday school about being gracious in our reply to folks. Grace is where it's undeserved. And so give, for, give people that. Always use this criteria when you're going to say something. Ask yourself, number one, is it true? Secondly, ask yourself, is it kind? If it's true, but it's not kind, then don't say it. Because number three, you always ask yourself, is it necessary? Do I need to say this? A lot of times we say things that aren't necessary to say. Can I help you with something? You don't always say everything you know. You don't always say everything you know. You don't have to. So you don't tell them negative things. Number four. You, you need to use physical touch to express your empathy. You know what it is? It's a squeeze of the hand. It's a pat on the back. It may be a touch on the elbow. And what you're saying is, I care. I care. Everything will be all right. Or I'm praying for you. Or I'm aware, I'm aware of your heartache. I'm aware of your situation, and I care about you. That's all that means. How many times you read through the Gospels and Jesus touched somebody? He, 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 he was uh, touching them, letting them know he cared. You don't, you don't love people well if you keep your distance from them. And so you have to let them know that you care. Jesus touched them. Let me give you number five. Show confidence in them. This is important. This is what Jesus did in John 21 to Peter. If you're still open in John 21, you know, Peter is discouraged. In, in the first part there in John 21, uh, when he says, it, it talks about together with Simon Peter called Didymus and Nathanael and, uh, of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. So we've got Thomas, Nathanael, James and John, and then two other disciples. So you've got six other guys that are going with Peter. Seven of them out there fishing. And when Peter says... I go a fishing, okay? The, the go there is the same continual sense as ask and it shall be given to you. Ask and ask and ask and keep on asking. Seek and seek and seek and keep on seeking. That continual sense. So what Peter is saying is, I'm going to go and go and keep on going fishing. What was Peter before he was a disciple? He was a fisherman. You know what he's saying? I'm going back to what I know best. I messed this discipleship thing up. I've already cursed and sworn tonight I knew Christ. So I'm just going to go back to fishing. And, and imagine, imagine him deciding to go back and go back to fishing. And by the way, he took six guys with him. Don't, don't ever think if you backslide or you get heartbroken and you just chuck it all that you won't affect anybody else. You will. You will affect others. Peter did. 
And here's the thing. So then he, the Lord calls him to the shore, and we read that. And, and, he, and he, he, when he tells him, Simon, son of Jonas, in verse 15, Lovest thou me more than these? And he said, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. What did Jesus say unto him? Feed my lambs. In verse 16, he said, Feed my sheep. And in verse 17, he said, Feed my sheep. You know what he's telling Peter? Peter, I still have plans for you. I still have confidence in you. I still have something for you to do for me. I've still got, and that was, that was telling Peter, I've got some confidence in you. And I'm not done with you yet. Who was, who was the main guy at Pentecost? It was Peter. Who's the main man through the early days of the church up until the Apostle Paul? It was Peter. He was the spokesman. He was the leader. I don't think that ever would have happened had Jesus not put the confidence in him that he wanted to use him again. Express confidence in somebody. How many of you know, when I say the name Charles Weigel, how many of you know the name Charles Weigel? Hmm? Just a few of you do. Charles Weigel wrote a famous song called, No One Ever Cared for Me Like Jesus. Now, do you know who Charles Weigel is? Yeah, quite a few of you do. Charles Weigel was an evangelist as a young man and hold meetings in different places. Evangelist goes from different churches in those days, uh, back in the 40s and 50s, uh, maybe, even, maybe it might have been early 60s, they, they, they did uh, citywide meetings, and many churches would go together and host a revival meeting. We had a, uh, found an old, Bob Reed found an old uh, flyer from a revival meeting of Dr. John R. Rice uh, in Indiana, I think it was dated around 1945 or so. It was for 12 days, two weeks, 14 days. I think it was two weeks long and uh, amazing. But, but that's what they did. Well, through this time, Charles Weigel came home, and there was a note on the table, and it was from his wife. And she said, I don't want to live this life. She wanted the life of the city and the bright lights and just a really a life of sin. And she left him with their two-year-old little baby. And he sat down in tears and at the piano, but it was through that experience he wrote the song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus since I found in him a friend so kind and true. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. And, and it, 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 it stemmed from that incident. And he thought he's through. He says, I'll never have a ministry. I'll never do anything. But he got a letter. He got a letter in the mail from Dr. Lee Robertson, who was at Highland Park Baptist Church and Tennessee Temple Schools in those days. And Lee Robertson invited him to come to Tennessee Temple, where he could... He could minister there and work in the music department and, and, and do some preaching, and he'd give him an apartment to live in. You know what he did? He gave him some confidence that he could be used again by God. And Charles Weigel went there and spent, spent a couple decades at Tennessee Temple University serving God, influencing future students for the Lord, future servants of God, and was used in a great way. Why? Because somebody expressed confidence in him that he could be used again. You see, when people get brokenhearted, they lose their confidence. They don't think that they'll ever be used again. Don't think God would ever do anything with their life again. That's why Peter went back to fishing. That's what he knew. And that's what he thought he could do. So uh, express confidence in Maybe it's a card. Maybe it's a note. Maybe it's something you'll say. But let them know that it's still the same between you and them and that you believe in them. It'll help them immensely if you express confidence in them. And then let me give you number six. Try and discern what they need. Try and discern what they need. What are they reaching for? Not... Hey, not what you're comfortable doing, but what do they need? Most of us just want to do what we're comfortable doing, not what somebody really needs. Do they need assurance that they're loved? Do they need confidence 
Do they need companionship? Whatever it is, give that to them. Now, let me say this. It's our human nature not to want to do that. I mean, uh, all of us have been in a situation where we know that somebody's fishing for a compliment. And what's the last thing we want to do? Give it to them. <laughs> Am I right? That's our human nature. That's just the way we are. And I guess you could say that's our fallen nature. That's, that's human nature, but guess what? It is not God's nature. God's nature is to give people what they need and what they want. And we have to choose to love as Christ loved and minister to people as Christ ministered to people. That's loving the brokenhearted. What do they need? What are they crying out for? Let me give that to them. Let me help them with that. So we're going to be the same. We're not going to analyze them. We're not going to say negative things to them. We're going to use physical touch. We're going to show confidence in them. We're going to try and discern what they need or what they're reaching for. But let me say a word now this morning to those who are brokenhearted. Not that you're helping someone who's brokenhearted, but you're the brokenhearted one. Can I, let, me, let me give you one thing that I want to help you. Do not withdraw. Do not withdraw. That's what yourself is screaming for you to do. Not to be around anybody. That's naturally what people want to do. It's normal to feel that way, but it could be fatal to do it. I know when heartache comes or heartbreak comes, uh, we'd just rather go away and hide. Not, not see anybody, not talk to anybody. That's why... Peter would just go fishing. Jeremiah said, I know what I'll do. He said, I'll just build an inn out here in the middle of nowhere, and, and that's where I'll go, and I'm just going to stay out here, and I'm not going to talk about God or say anything about God, and I'm just going to forget about it all. That's what Jeremiah said. That's when Jeremiah said, but his word was like a fire inside of me, and I couldn't stop from speaking. But people got that way. I want you to remember, don't withdraw. Listen, you are still loved by people. You are still cared for by people. You're, 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 you're still accepted by people. And let me say this, you're still wanted by people. You're wanted by people. I know all those thoughts are not thoughts that you'll think. You'll think nobody cares. Nobody, they don't want me at that church anymore. They don't want to be, don't want to be around me. And that's all a lie of the devil. That is not true. That's stinking thinking. And you have to not think that way. Stay with those who love. The father could not help the prodigal. Couldn't do anything for him. Until he came home. When he was away, he couldn't help him. He had to come home. One of the worst things you want to, one of the, one of the last things you feel like doing when you're broken hearted or you're going through a hard time is, is come to church. But that's exactly what you need. And, and when, when somebody recently was going to come back to church after being gone for a while, they said, first they asked, they, they, they called me and said, am I welcome to come back? The answer is yes. Well, will, will I, will I, well, I have to answer questions. No, I certainly hope not. And by the way, don't you ever be that way. Someone comes through those doors, haven't been there for a year or two, don't say, man, where you been? Huh? Don't do that. Say, welcome back. Sure is good to see you. So glad you're back in church. See? Welcome them back. All right? And, and that's, that's what we, that, that's, we're ministering to the brokenhearted. And the brokenhearted, don't withdraw. Don't move away. Stay around people who will love you, who will help you to get you back to where God will use you again. We're, what, all we want to do is get you back to the one who can heal the brokenhearted. I can't heal the brokenhearted. You can't heal the brokenhearted, but we can help get them to the one who can. And that's all we want to do. 
And when our heart's broken, you can help point us to the one who can heal our heart. It works both ways. Little chorus we used to sing, He is able, He is able, I know He is able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able, he's able, I know he is able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He heals the brokenhearted, and he sets the captive free. He made the lame to walk again, and he caused the blind to see. He is able, he is able, I know he is able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. That's the brokenhearted that he's able to help. The one who are in captive that he's able to help. Now, let me just say this and we'll close. I'm not sure how long in between I say this and we'll close, but it'll be <laughs> somewhere after that. I said, well, Pastor, if he came to bind up the brokenhearted, if he came to heal the brokenhearted, why are there so many brokenhearted people in the world? And there are a lot of brokenhearted people in the world. And can I say this? I believe this is why. God's willing to hurt your feelings to save your soul. God's willing to hurt your feelings to save your soul. I'm sure there's a part of Abraham that didn't quite understand why God would make him wait so long for a son, the promised son, then give him to him, and then tell him to go sacrifice that son. I'm sure there had to be part of Abraham who didn't quite understand that. But I believe that when God found a man that was willing to give his son for God, it would be an indication for us that God will be willing to give His Son for man. I'm sure Mary was, maybe she understood completely, we don't know her level of understanding. As she was at the cross watching her Son be crucified. Nobody understands what, a, what would be in the heart of a mother watching her Son having been beaten and crucified like that. That was, I'm sure, very heartbreaking to her as he was nailed to the cross. But God understood by giving his only begotten son millions, billions could be saved. Billions could come to eternal life through Jesus Christ. You know, we, come, we, we can maybe come a little bit understand, to understand this if, if we discipline our own children. We teach our children, in fact, if your children, okay, illustration, down right, right home where we live, okay? The other night I was in the front yard and I, was, I had mowed the yard and I was blowing off the grass and... Um, Drew wanted to come out front where I was. And I uh, had to put some more gasoline in the blower, and I went in the garage and put some gas in. When I came back out, I didn't see Drew. I fear he went back inside. And I'm blowing the walks off, and down the street comes a fella with Drew. Yeah, he was two doors down and brought him back. And here's the thing. Mama gave him a warm seat for doing that because mom has talked to him about wandering away and you don't go out of our yard. And he disobeyed. Now what are we saying? Listen, if your child went in the street or if your child did that, you know what you do? You give him some pain to avoid the pain of getting run over or avoid the pain of being abducted by somebody. You, you know what that pain would be like. You want him to experience some pain so he won't have the worst pain. Do you understand? And so we, we kind of get that. And so a broken heart, God can heal. God can mend. But an unsaved soul 
he has to let go to hell. He cannot do anything with that. No parent wants to willingly hurt their child, but will hurt them in a way that we know will heal rather than have them hurt in a way that leads to death. Now, not all heartache certainly is caused by God. It isn't. Sometimes our heartache is caused by our own disobedience, by our own choices we make. I can be broken hearted that I have to go to prison but I did steal the car and if I stole the car I got to go to prison do you understand I can't blame God for that broken heart I may have been in a getting a bad relationship and or, or go through a divorce but but if it's because of my pride and my refusal to apologize and I'm not bowing down to anybody then I have to blame myself for my own broken heart. I say, well, God never did anything for me. Well, I hear people say that. Well, I could list a number of things God's done for them. But people say, God doesn't answer my prayer. God doesn't do anything for me. But they never go to church. They never open their Bible. They never do anything that God says they should do. But God certainly ought to be doing everything for me. God never said there be, wouldn't be broken hearts. He did say he'd bandage them up. Now listen to me. There's many people in this room today. You came to know Christ as your Savior because you had a broken heart. You went through some pain. You went through a tough time in your life that caused you to look for answers. That's why the prison ministry is so effective. Those men, some of those men in there are broken hearted. The choices they made, they know they've made bad choices. And they realize, I've, I've been in control of my life and look where it's gotten me. I'm ready for someone else to be in control. And they're ready to give their life to Christ. And you may be here this morning, you may be going through a hard time, you may be in a rough place. But God may have you right in that place. So you'll have nowhere to look but up. Say, God, I need you. I need you. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, you may be going through your hard time just so you could be saved. Just so you'd look to Christ and you could receive Him as your personal Savior. It's what she sang this morning. From the door of an orphanage to the house of a king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags unto riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not worthy to be here. But praise God, I belong. That's the, that's the verse of the chorus we sing at the end of the service. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Did you hear what he said? From the door of an orphanage to the house of a king. That's what we were before salvation and after salvation. Rags under riches, from the weak to the strong. None of us are worthy to be here. But praise God, I belong. Why? Because not what I've done, what Jesus has done for me. And I've trusted him as my Savior. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. I'm a part of the family, the family of God. And if you're not a part of the family of God, receive Christ as your Savior today. And you'll become part of the family. Going to heaven is not about what you've done. It's about what Jesus did for you. And you accepting him as your Savior. Do that today. I'd rather, hey, hey, I'd rather have a broken heart and a saved soul than, than to have to go through having a broken heart and a lost soul. Don't let that happen to you.